Thank you, Rain. As Rain just mentioned, my name is Martin Johnson, and my colleague Jeremy Wilden and I are co-presenting today. And we'd like to just take a moment to thank all of you for your interest and for coming. Um, to get started, by raise of hand, how many of you have used a radio module before? Raise your hand. So quite a few people over here have, and quite a few people over here have not. That's a good mix. Uh, I would say about 50% have and 50% haven't. This is the right place for you. OK, so there are a bunch of different types of radio modules available. Um, raise your hand if you would like to share with the group the radio module that you've used before. In the back. I use some uh, XBs for my second brother. XBs, OK. Any other people want to share with us what you've used? OK. I've played around with JSON Rock, you know, ASK modules and stuff. And OK, do you remember who? Made it or what type oh, it was? Out of China. Okay. <laughs> uh, our company does home automation. We use Ember chipset home automation. Okay. Wow. So 802.15.4 Zigbee or? Zig Zigbee HP okay. profile. Great. Others? Do some of the microchip ones. Microchip? Okay. Um, over here. USRP. 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 I've heard of that one. It's a software defined development platform for radio. Okay. Good. So, those of you who, are, who have used radio modules before know that there are a whole bunch of different types you can get. There are some that are designed for very short range, some that are designed for very long range. Um, different types of modulation schemes. The gentleman in the back mentioned ASK, which stands for Amplitude Shift Keying. It's a form of AM modulation. Others use more sophisticated modulation techniques. Um, and the price range is uh, all over the map, from a few dollars to uh, over a hundred for a radio module. The landscape is one that uses radio modules that are typically, um, you interface to them either through a serial port or um, a UART or some other serial protocol, and they have uh, built-in functionality. Some of them have APIs, some of them don't. And what we're wanting to do with this project is make the firmware open source so that the user has complete flexibility over how the module works. <coughs> so I wanted to just get us all up to speed. Those of you who've used them before, this will be nothing new. Those of you that haven't used them before, maybe this will be new to you. So what is a radio module? A radio module is a, a small device, usually smaller than your hand. Some of them are smaller than a fingertip. And they take data in and out through a wired connection. And they send that data out the antenna and also receive that data in, in through the antenna. Of course, they're built onto a circuit board. There's some kind of power supply and voltage regulation on the circuit board. And there's a, a microprocessor. Sometimes you, like I mentioned a minute ago, you have an application programming interface to that microprocessor, and sometimes you don't. Um, in those cases, you simply send data in, and it comes out the antenna, and you have zero control over what happens in between. Uh, also, inside of the radio module, there is a transceiver that takes the, the bits, the ones and zeros, the, the, uh, the voltage signal between whatever your host is and the radio module and puts it onto uh, a radio carrier. In 
transmit mode. In receive mode, it does just the opposite. And I'm not sure why that's flickering. Let me try to tighten up the, ca the cable here. <coughs> Hopefully that fixed it. Um, so in receive mode, it takes the, the very, very weak signal that's coming from the antenna, amplifies it a whole bunch, and sends demodulated data out one of the I.O. pins. Some radio modules have a power amp that boosts up the signal that gets transmitted so that um, you can go a longer distance between the points that you're trying to communicate. The drawback of transmitting more power is that it also requires more energy. So if you have a battery powered device, you have to take that into account. Uh, some radio modules also include uh, an amplifier uh, that goes in between the antenna and the radio transceiver chip that's on there. And that has the effect of improving the receiver sensitivity, which makes it possible to also increase the distance between the transmitter and the receiver. As I said before, there's a, there are a whole bunch of different types of radio modules that you can currently buy from DigiKey or Mauser or other sources. Some of them are FCC certified and some of them are not. Um, the, the ones that are FCC certified, you can drop one of those into your project and use it without having to go through FCC. And Jeremy's gonna talk a little bit more about that toward the end of the presentation. Um, the modules that are not FCC certified require that they be tested by a test lab before you can sell them either in the United States or internationally. If, if you're selling them internationally, there are other uh, radiated emissions requirements that you have to comply with, and it varies country by country. But in the US and some other countries that are harmonized with the US, the FCC uh, governs how, how strong the radiated emissions can be. Um, when we started on this project, we weren't aware of any other radio modules that are open source. So this particular radio module, one of the main thrusts of our wanting to do this project was to give back to the open source community. This is our way of contributing back. And um, having the ability to use firmware that you write in your radio module to do what you want it to do ties in nicely with the comments that the gentleman that gave the keynote speech this morning made. Um, we've heard for a long time the Internet of Things, and he added one word to that. Does anybody remember what it is? Yours. The Internet of My Things. If I buy a radio module, I want to be able to have it do what I want it to do for my application, and the, the open source community is a perfect place to make that happen because the people who are in this room are capable of uh, programming it to do whatever they want it to do. There are lots of applications for radio modules. Um, maybe the people that have used them before can pick something from this list or maybe you have something that's not in this list take a minute to look through it and if you used your radio module for something other than this and can and want to share it, raise your hand. While you're thinking about it, I'll go down the list. So, Jeremy and um, the first presenter this morning talked about using these little 
computer modules that you can get. One of them is called Arduino. There's another one called Raspberry Pi, which is starting to get a lot of, uh, gain a lot of momentum in the marketplace. And these little computers are really useful for doing a wide variety of different projects. And using a radio module attached to one of them allows you to communicate between that device and anything else that you can. Uh, looks like Jeremy's trying to fix the flickering. So a radio module allows you to communicate between your Arduino or your Raspberry Pi or your computer or your other uh, microcontroller board and just about anything else. One more slide. Um, depending on which radio module you use determines how much flexibility you'll have in setting up the communication between all of your devices and how far apart they can be. You can use them as a serial cable replacement. We don't use serial cables too much anymore. They're, uh, most laptops come with two or four or six USB ports. You can also use them for digital I.O. line passing where if I twiddle an I.O. line over here, I can make an I.O. line over there or over there or both in both places twiddle along with the one that I'm twiddling locally. And the same in reverse, right? People use them a lot for UAVs to uh, both monitor and control. You can get telemetry information back from the UAV. You can also send commands to the UAV. Um, robots. They're really popular in doing little hobby projects where you want to be able to communicate with your robot without having a tether going to it. Um, weather stations. If you have a bunch of sensors out in the middle of nowhere collecting information about um, the, which direction the wind is blowing, how fast, did it rain, what's the temperature, what's the humidity, all of that information is aggregated and stored at the weather station and then periodically the weather station can wake up and send that information to some place where people actually live and care about it. Wireless sensors are is kind of an industry buzzword right now. Everybody wants to do wireless sensors. Um, remote automation and the, the more sensors or remote nodes there are, the more important it is for them to all be able to communicate with each other. And if you are, if your nodes are spread far apart and you can't create a single radio link that goes from your farthest node to the central node, they can communicate with one another in between using, um, uh, using the intermediate nodes as repeaters or mesh nodes to tie everything together. Uh, and I inserted a few pictures of various different ways that I've seen wireless modules used. And I guess I should be over here now so I can go to the next slide. This, is, this slide is an overview of the hardware that is in the extra B module. So kind of the left half is digital and the right half is analog. Um, and we spent, we spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I want to just highlight some of the main points. And I'll start on the left side with uh, the, the ways that it interfaces with other electronics. And then I'll finish on the right side where the antennas are located. Make sense? So on the right, excuse me, the left, there are several different ways that we can interface with the extra B module. Uh, one of them is a UART, 
where you have TXD and RXD going in and out, and there's also a provision for hardware handshaking with um, CTS and RTS signals. Those of you who've used USARTs before will recognize those names. There's also a serial peripheral interface, and our goal was to make this as flexible as possible so that if you have, if, if your device has uh, almost any way to communicate with it, you can connect the extra B to it. Uh, you can also interface with it using USB or two-wire interface like I squared C. There are analog to digital converter. There's an analog to digital converter in it and several of the pins on the module can be connected to analog sources and you can actually measure voltages. There's also a digital to analog converter in it and it can be multiplexed out to a couple of different pins. There are a bunch of G general purpose inputs and outputs and there's even a way to have a couple of the pins do pulse width modulation output which is a another way of doing a digital to analog conversion that requires an external filter or you can use it to um, do motor control and so forth. Inside the processor, by the way, the processor we chose is an Atmel X Mega. How many have used uh, an Atmel Mega processor before? A few of you. How many of you have used uh, an X Mega before? It's kind of the next generation, and they're, it's actually amazing what they've been able to squeeze into these microprocessors, which are pretty cheap. They're, you can get a processor that's quite capable for under a couple of bucks in low quantity. Uh, there's an infrared communication module in there. There's a direct memory access controller. It has onboard encryption, AES or DES encryption. There's an engine built right into it. Uh, and I think it's 128-bit key, is that right? Um, there's a bunch of flash, there's a EE prom, and some static RAM. And all of this is in a module that's the size of your thumb tip. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the, and transition over into the analog part of the module. As I mentioned before, there's a radio transceiver, and the one that we picked is made by Atmel. And I'll just quickly take you through it, the transmit side. There's a, a crystal oscillator that a PLL uses as its reference, and it generates a, 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 a signal which is, has already been modulated, which I, is not shown in the diagram, but then it's amplified and it goes into another integrated circuit made by RFMD and this is actually a really cool chip. It does a lot of things in a very, very small package. Um, it, there's a switch that selects between transmit and receive and there's a, a power amplifier and a filter to filter off unwanted harmonics and there's an, uh, a second switch that uh, selects the, between antenna A and antenna B. Why would you want to have two antennas? In case one fails, In case one fails why else? Diversity. Diversity. Um, uh, the module does have the capability to transmit on multiple frequencies, but the broadcast to all the other ones stay individual? No, the reason that we have two, and if you've used a, a Wi-Fi router before, you probably noticed that those usually have two antennas. And the reason is, was mentioned by a gentleman over here, it's f to provide spatial diversity. Uh, in radio environments, there are reflections, and when reflections happen, the signal bounces around and creates constructive and destructive interference regions in space and the destructive regions are 
weak signal amplitude and the constructive regions of space are high signal amplitude. And if you position these two antennas just right, if one of them is in a dead spot, the other one will be in a hot spot. And the module can pick the antenna and use the antenna that's in the hottest spot. So we're not aware of any other radio modules that have uh, spatial diversity antennas. So that was the transmit side. Does that make sense? In the receive side, we'll go the opposite direction. There's a low noise amplifier, and again, this, the transmit receive switch selects which half of the chip is being used at any given time. Um, and then it goes through some filtering and down conversion and eventually it converts an, the analog signal back into a digital signal and the bits come out one of these ports. Make sense? Any questions? One in the back. Since you have the two antennas, can you uh, lend that to MIMO? This one isn't intended for MIMO, uh, though there are probably some people in this room that are much smarter than I am about multiple input, multiple output systems, and it might be possible to make it work. So that's a great question. Any other questions? Okay. And <clears throat> it's really small. This is a picture of one taken next to a quarter. And up at the top, we've got dual spatial diversity antennas, which I just talked about. This is the chip that does the front end amplification, both in transmit and receive. This is the chip that is the radio transceiver. And I didn't mention it before, but we're the the standard that the radio transceiver uses is uh, written by the IEEE. It's the 802.15.4 standard, which defines the physical layer and the MAC layer for uh, Zigbee, which is another popular industry buzzword. And then at the bottom is the X mega processor. Along each side, there are 10 pins on either side that take the signals in and out. There are three different antenna options. One uses these integrated antennas. The other one allows you to use wire monopole antennas. And the third option on the other side, there are some RF connectors that allow you to put a little RF cable out to some external antennas of, of your choice. The advantages and disadvantages are listed there on the bottom. These antennas are the smallest, but they're also the and, and they're also the least expensive. Uh, they don't provide as much range as uh, having external antennas like we would have over here, and then kind of a medium one in the middle. Um, there are. I wanted to take just a minute and describe what the pins are on the module. Of course, there's power and ground, um, data in and out, and we talked about all of the different ways we can get data in and out of it. There's a reset pin. There are two PWM outputs, eight general purpose digital inputs and outputs, and five analog to digital converters. Uh, they're 12 bit, two mega sample per second. ADCs, and you can use either an internal or an external voltage reference on those. Two, two DACs, uh, an RSSI pin, which allows you to your host application to measure the received signal strength, which is useful for determining link quality. And there's also uh, an IRDA infrared uh, data port. Some of the performance specifications are listed here. Uh, you can run the thing clear down to 2.1 volts and up to 3.5 volts. It transmits uh, about 200 milliwatts and consumes only 250 milliamps in transmit mode. It's got fantastic sensitivity on the receiver and it's actually probably even better than that. 
maybe one minus 103 and the received current is only 28 milliamps so between uh, the transmit power and the received sensitivity uh, you'll be able to go a very long distance and we have some slides that Jeremy will show later that demonstrate that and with the, the amount of current that it consumes while it's in use and while it's sleeping it will allow you to make a make the thing last on a single battery for many many years uh, assuming that it's asleep most of the time and transmits only part of the time we've done tests up to two miles with uh, a couple of the modules that will demonstrate in a few minutes and you can transfer data at a rate of 250 kilobits per second so with that Does the power change based on the power no, the, you can adjust the, the transmit power level up to a maximum, but the amount of power that is delivered to the antenna doesn't change based on the antenna itself, no. If you turn down the transmit power, you can make the modules less current. As long as you have a decent set of antennas, any brand of antenna should consume the same amount of energy. So with that, I'll turn the time over to Jeremy Wilden and Thank you for your attention. All right. So you heard the little allusion to the possibility of Zigbee. Of course, most of the capability of this thing is going to be defined by what firmware we put into it. So far, we've only developed some really, really basic stuff. We've got a serial port coming in, sends it out over the air, serial port on the other end. I'm, I think that's what a lot of people are using them for anyway. You hook it up to a couple of Arduinos and you're sending a little data between them or you have your Arduino talking back to your computer, something like that. There are a lot of other features we want to add, but then again, it's an open source project, so we can all add together whatever we want, whatever people are most interested in. Um, <clears throat> as Martin explained, over the air we use 802.15.4. That's the underpinnings of Zigbee and a whole bunch of other wireless standards. These chips came out a few years back and it was uh, supposed to be the be-all, end-all of radio technologies. Since then, we've had about five other be-all, end-alls of radio technologies that everyone says we're going to have 50-cent chipsets to implement everything. And none of them have ever quite gotten to the hype, but the 802.15.4 chips have gone a good distance towards being what you want out of a radio chipset. So just running 802.15.4 is a very basic point-to-point -point or point-to-multipoint link. You can build on top of that a Zigbee network by adding the mesh networking. Um, someone in the automation this morning, was Z-Wave based, based on 802.15.4 or not? No. no, it's not. It might be. Um, so WiMAX certainly isn't. ISA 100 is based on it. That's a very serious, intense industrial networking type that you see like in oil refineries and stuff. Wireless heart, similar kind of thing, but those are both, I believe, based on 802.15.4. So is six low pan. So in theory, any one of these protocols could be supported by the extra B module if we take the time to implement them. I understand there are, there, there's at least one and possibly more than one open source Zigbee stack that theoretically could be ported to this device. Haven't tried it yet. Um, we tried porting one existing 802.15.4 stack and it ended up being kind of complicated. Um, my background's more in hardware. I'm only, I've only been doing software embedded firmware development for a few years, so I'm sure there's some of you who would uh, be able to do what I couldn't pretty easily. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, we can get there. We can, we can build all that. The focus right now is just getting this basic, straightforward pro protocol out there so we can use the radios um, and, uh, and may not have all the bells and whistles that we want. Right now, we've already implemented a basic command mode. Uh, anyone use the command mode to configure an XB or a similar radio module, right? It's old school. It's like back to Hayes modem AT command type stuff, right? Get the terminal out, push plus, plus, plus. It says OK, and you type AT, DT, and, and all kinds of funky stuff like that, right? We're building around that because that's what people are used to. Uh, it's easy. It's straightforward. The, the state machines that it took to build the code to do that, I mean, it's, you know, it's a page of code. It's really simple kind of stuff. It allows us to keep the code compact. Um, you know, there's a, we'll probably follow the pretty conventional command set that ATCH sets or reads the channel, the network ID is ID, and BD sets and reads the baud rate. 
Today's code that's running on it today is fixed at 115 k baud, uh, 115 kilobits per second, strictly speaking. Uh, and that's one of the first parameters that will be changeable as soon as I finish putting the rest of the pieces on the AT command set. Um, it's already set up to save its configuration to an EEPROM, so it'll be non-volatile and survive a reboot. But at the moment, that's being defined at compile time, and the AT command mode interface isn't actually changing those values yet. It should be soon. So we've set up the uh, support and development community on extrab.org. We've already set up a GitHub repository, though I honestly I haven't checked the code in there yet because I'm trying to add just a few more features before other, everyone else starts seeing how bad my code is. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and one other very key thing is we, we don't have the bootloader integrated yet. A few months ago, I started working with, um, I think it was Xboot, to try and get the bootloader running so that we could have an Arduino compile it. But I realized the most important thing we had to do first is get it transmitting and receiving. So I just went to bare metal code. I'm just developing it in, in Atmel Studio 6. It's the free downloadable Atmel Studio, and I download it directly to the devices. Not really hard yet, but the goal is very soon to be using the bootloader so that we can use Arduino. If you came to the earlier presentation on Arduino, you download the program, uh, gives you a little window, you have an example in there, and you can immediately write five lines of code, download it into the device, and it does something useful and interesting. So we're not there yet, but that is absolutely the goal, the key, uh, one of the big features that we think is going to make it really cool for all of us. Uh, if you've ever done an Arduino or other embedded project, you know, you'll take radio module, hook it to an adapter board, take that, hook it to your Arduino board, and now you've, you're into this solution like 50 bucks now in parts or more. Uh, and we think it's a little bit better, especially for something you want to be able to install and leave or, or deploy a little bit more widely, if you can download your own firmware right into the module. So we're, we're still going to have to deal with some potential gotchas from the FCC. When you get your FCC approval, they... Uh, don't want people to be able to change the firmware, and we have information about that on the website on what our plans are to work around that. Uh, but that is the big plan going forward. So like I said, Atmel Studio 6, it uses a GCC compiler in the AVR tool chain. Um, you can download that. Uh, you, you may have to register on Atmel's website, but you know you can use a, a Hotmail address for that if you don't want them sending you an email. And, and they're at least in my experience, they aren't bad about pestering you, even if you did register with your own email address. I'm sure I had another thought there because I had a blank bullet point. Don't know what that additional point was. Sorry. Don't you hate it when you do that? So we went out and did some range testing with this. Uh, just so you can see it, let's just show you a picture of the board. That is one of the modules. We only have two of them built up so far. So there's his twin brother on the other board. Um, I'm going to take the other one off here just so you can see again close up. The autofocus will hopefully kick in here soon. Again, there are the, uh, and we'll zoom out. There's autofocus. So the three chips Martin pointed out, the microcontroller, isn't that incredible how small those are now? The RF transceiver chip, and the RF power amplifier. And uh, we really love these. There's, these are some really amazing parts. Um, you know, we've been Martin and I have been working together for 10 years at different companies. We've been designing wireless products for a long time. So uh, the fact that we've been able to do this with so few chips now, we didn't have to have a low noise amplifier that was a separate part and a separate transmit receive switch and a bunch of matching networks and all of that uh, is really cool. And that's why we think that this thing will also be pretty cheap to manufacture in production. Uh, but the other really sweet part that Martin allu alluded to is that it's an X mega processor. Again, show of hands, who's worked with a mega processor, either on an Arduino or something like it, right? Pretty nice, pretty easy to work with. Anyone have any complaints? It's one of my favorite microcontrollers. I'm not as big a fan of many of the other platforms. Everyone else, some of you guys agree? The megas are great. They had a few shortcomings. The X mega has helped make them a lot better. Sorry, I meant to uh, move that back so you have something interesting to look at. <laughs> so you can see the top of the module. You can see we have the wire antennas on this one. The X megas are a lot more flexible. They run at a lot higher speed. We're at 32 megahertz instead of 8 or 16, depending on the, the part and the, the board that you put it on. Um, the, they have similar ranges of memory, but they have uh, some, some pretty cool features, uh, including you know, DMA for I.O. to memory streaming, and uh, you know, so you can take counter timer values and stream them into memory for fast pulse measurements. 
Uh, it has an event system so that we can get a signal from the transceiver chip that indicates whether we're transmitting or receiving, routed into a comparator, and then it's routed in hardware over to uh, uh, a counter timer that now timestamps when the packets are transmitted and received. I'm not using those features yet, but the fact that we can do that kind of stuff is going to be really slick. So it's a nice step up from the Mega. There was a bit of a learning curve. So for any of you who have used Mega and haven't moved up to X Mega, if you want to use the advanced features, it's a little bit you know daunting at first. But you know, start slow. Start from the code that we're going to provide, and and you can probably get into it pretty quick. You don't have to use all the advanced features. But they've done some great stuff with the latest generation of the Atmel AVRs. Uh, this is one of the sorry switching screens. Come on, switch. This is a range test we did up near Martin's house. Um, and if you want to go see, go to extrab.org and it'll take you to a link on a Kickstarter page that shows a video of this actual test. So we set up, we borrowed one of the city's uh, recycle bins over here and set one of the radios up about waist height. And we had it set up as a loopback. So we take this little connector, has the, this is just, it's not a serial in and out, it just loops back data in to data out. So any data that comes out goes looped right back in and gets retransmitted back at the radio. And then we take the other one with us for a walk attached to the laptop. So we send out a radio transmission, comes in through the serial port, gets translated into 802.11, uh, sorry, 802.15.4, goes out the antenna, gets transmitted, the other end receives it, it gets echoed back, retransmitted, we receive it on our end. That way we can see are we out of range? Are we in range? Are we getting packet errors? Things like that. So keep in mind this initial test, we were only using one of the two antennas. We did not have diversity turned on. We were not transmitting from alternate antennas. We also didn't have retries turned on, which means if the packet gets even one bit corrupted in it, it ends up getting lost. Uh, the chipset has the ability to handle automatic retransmissions. So you tell it, I want this packet to go through to this address, and it will keep trying as many times as it needs to as many times as you tell it to, until it gets an acknowledgement back from the other end. Now, of course, in broadcast, you know, retries don't work. You just send multiple copies. But uh, we didn't have any of that turned on, which makes the link a lot better. And we took a walk all the way out. So right now, this is a, a brand new high school, and there's a big, giant chain link fence along here. So we were basically trying to pipe the signal th you know, laterally through this big chain link fence. And uh, how, you were holding it about high, Martin, about head height on our end. The other end was about waist height, a bunch of chain link and trees, which of course trees and the moisture in the leaves absorb 2.4 gigahertz, which isn't great. But, uh, and even clear out here at 1,200-ish you know, feet, uh, what did we have, 98, 99%? We're losing 1%. We're losing 1% of the packets at that distance. Yes, please. Where your antennas? Was it just over average? Those. And only one of them was being used. So uh, the power amplifier makes a huge difference. Uh, it's transmitting 200 milliwatts. The chipset by itself transmits uh, two or three milliwatts. Uh, and of course, the receive sensitivity is better as well because we have this low noise amplifier. So, it's pretty good range, especially without the retries turned on. Then, Martin, do, did we put in slides for the other longer they range are, tests? They're, they're further they're on, they're hidden up. away. Martin did some additional tests where instead of having some obstructions in the way, he did some clear line of sight, set up one of them down on a street in Draper drove all the way up so, so you could see from the hill there were no obstructions. You could literally see to the transmitter. And we posted the results to that on extrab.org as well. And we were a little over two miles. What was your longest one? It's on there? OK, we did. Oh, it is on there. I thought it was hidden. My bad. Uh, we were only a mile away. This one, though, you weren't as high, right? That was straight level, a straight shot about six feet off the ground on both sides. So 40% packet hour error rate meant we were only getting 60% of the packets through. But again, no retries, no retransmissions, no multiple, multiple transmit. Different car antennas or same antennas? Same antennas. But instead of 1,200 feet, we were a little over 5,000 feet. And you were only using one still or both? One antenna, one transmission, one copy of each transmission, no retries, no acknowledgments. So that's giving you a baseline of the, the inherent performance of the radio. Once you turn on retries and all that other stuff, you can kind of mask sub-optimal performance. You can kind of hide it. Yes, please. Uh, so if the packet was lost in the transmission or the return path, it yes. shows up in this total. So right. if you're communicating one direction, right. you it's, get a little better than that number. If you, if you split the difference, in effect, we're losing 20% of the packets in each direction. So Martin took it out a little farther. 
went to a little over two miles, but now the one end is a little bit higher, so there are fewer obstructions instead of across level ground with cars driving in between. You know, twice the distance, but much clearer line of sight, only a 15% packet loss. We got 85% of the packets through, again, losing 7 or 8% each direction. Yeah? And are you able to choose uh, the different Wi Fi channels, the 11 channels that are available that this is transmitting on? You, you can. We were setting it on, uh, of the 802.15.4 channels, there are about 15 or 16 of them. We chose like number three. So, these are different than the so we've chosen one. Yeah. It's different than Wi Fi channels. For each Wi Fi. They are. Uh, for, for one Wi-Fi channel, which is pretty broad, you get mm, like three 802.15.4 channels in there. And ideally, you'd want to not be on the same channel as a nearby really high power transmitter. But in a previous life on other projects, we've tested coexistence of Wi-Fi and 802.15.4, and they actually play really well together. They don't step on each other as much as you might think. Was there a question? Yes, please? I don't know hardly anything about radio, but it just strikes me that how could you have a whole bunch of these things in the same area and not just have them You, uh, a lot of these higher level networking protocols like Zigbee and ISA 100, basically their claim to fame is that they're coordinating the timing of everybody's transmissions and receptions with either time slots, uh, uh, pre-scheduled intervals and all of that. Even though they can communicate at 250 kilobits per second, every radio only gets a, a small allocated time slot. Now, if you wanted to just do a, a broadcast node or something like that, you could certainly take this module and turn down the transmit power. It reduces your range. And then if you only need to talk a short distance, you can make coexistence work a little better long range, too. So like if I had a neighbor who was doing the same thing, we could have collisions and right. something like that. Well, you well when you set up like an ID, like a right. each. Yeah, these, these have the concept. It's not exactly like an, uh, an SSID that's used for Wi-Fi, but they have what's called a PAN ID. There's uh, 65,000 addresses, uh, and you get to choose any one that you want. And even if you want to go further beyond that, you can send it to its IEEE 64-bit address and just unicast to a single device. So the other devices may hear the packets, but they'll ignore them. Uh, there's still the potential that if they both transmit at the same exact instant, you could lose packets. However, not delving too much into low-level radio theory, 802.15.4 is based on a type of modulation that is, while not exactly FM, is similar to it. And FM has the, I mean, you, you can tell the difference between AM and FM when you tune in your radio, right? AM sounds like crap because it's, any little piece of noise changes the amplitude of the signal and it creates interference. FM has what they call the FM capture effect. 802.15.4, I believe, gives you something very similar to it, where whatever the strongest station is, your receiver locks into and the other one effectively gets ignored unless they are just absolutely at the same signal level. And if you don't want them to be at exactly the same le uh, signal level, move your antenna an inch and they won't be anymore. So that also helps reduce the problem. So the devices in my house are talking to each other and even if they collided with one from my neighbor's house, because my receiver is closer or higher power, it's very likely that I will just hear my packet and not theirs. That makes sense? Yes? Five, thank you. Yes, John. Diversity help that as well. Diversity receiving. It depends. If if the chip locks in on hearing the packet from the neighbor next door first, then it may not have time to switch channels. Uh, I'm not sure how soon the chip starts ignoring a packet if it's not addressed to it. Yeah. So 250 kilohertz is the maximum. Absolute maximum. You streaming at that rate actual user data, there's going to be some overhead for network addressing, and if you're using that, you've, you've, you've completely saturated the channel. So what would you expect um, an actual data rate that, that somebody could expect to get? If you wanted to do 115K bidirectional between a pair of radios, you could probably do that and stream in both directions. That's enough overhead for networking. Um, most of the time, this isn't being used in an environment where you're trying to stream that much data, uh, but in theory, you could. So uh, another test, a little over two miles. Um, let me skip through a couple other things. So Martin's alluded to some of these things that you can do. It's, uh, the hardware is in there to do encrypted packets. I haven't enabled that. We haven't added those features to use that hardware encryption engine, but the, hard, you know, the stuff is all there, so we can use that. We want to do over-the-air firmware updates. It'd be cool to uh, make a version of firmware that does an RF channel scan. It basically gives you a low-end spectrum analyzer. Um, all of those are things we'd like to do. The most important key, and we saved the, uh, the pitch here for the end because we wanted to just talk the tech first and then just make our one request or appeal to you here at the end. Uh, 
because it's an open source project, we don't have, you know, we've, we've spent a bunch of money and time over the last six months developing this thing, but getting an FCC approval is very expensive, uh, you know, $10,000 plus. So we opted to ask for some help from everybody by setting up a Kickstarter project to try and fund the FCC approval. So if you would, even if you don't use it, would you please pass the word to somebody who might to take a look at the Kickstarter project? Uh, Kickstarter.extrad.org takes you and links you and then it redirects over to our, our Kickstarter project. It goes for another um, three or four weeks. Uh, once we pay for the FCC approval, then we have the modules available and, and the, the cost of them will be a lot lower than they would be on Kickstarter someday. So please help support us if you would. Yes? Interesting you'd observe that, yeah. Hmm. I probably shouldn't comment. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's kind of the idea. I probably shouldn't come right out and say that in case it ticks somebody off, right? We did our very best to follow that, yes. Have you done any temperature range testing in this? No, but if you watch the, uh, the video, you'll see this big foam cooler over my head. That's the temperature test chamber. Cool. We're going to run some of those tests on there. Uh, we're aware of the temperature ranges on the chips, and you can run them pretty hot and pretty cold. You don't want them to get wet, so no condensation. Yeah. Um, what are you looking at for a, like the final module price once you're past the Kickstarter? What, what's your range there? Our plan is to build just. We're not trying to build a, a company here. We're we're consultant engineers. Is our day jobs. This is a side thing. So we're not trying to build this into a big for-profit business. The concept we're using, and we don't have exact numbers, is to take this design, take it to a whole bunch of contract manufacturers, find out who gives us a good price and does a good job building them. We'll add some fixed markup cost to cover us to pay somebody to, to ship them out to Amazon and fulfill them or whatever. We're probably gonna, just gonna sell everything through Amazon and make it easy. Uh, so after Kickstarter's over, it's a, a fixed markup, low cost model. I can't remember off the top of my head, but we want it to be quite a bit cheaper than a lot of the commercial modules that are out there. So you go and look at like an XB or XB Pro on DigiKey and it's, you know, $28, $30, $35. We want to be quite a bit below that. We don't know where we're going to be yet, though, until we farm it out. And if we don't get it FCC approved, it won't matter anyway. <laughs> Any other questions? I know we're probably pretty much out of time. Anyone else? Uh, you can certainly come up real quick. We can, we can go out in the hall and talk afterwards So the next presentation. Are we done? We'll also, to try and... We've got a stretch goal in there, and we're going to open source the hardware at that level. The only reason we're holding off on that is, you know, just trying to figure out, can, can we make up a little of our time somehow? Uh, if the thing funds at the current goal, we're going to end up making like 200 bucks on the deal after everything's paid for. So we'll be paying ourselves like a dollar an hour for all of the development. If we hit the stretch goal, we can at least try and make up a little of our time.